This is a 1977 Volvo 66. And apart from being a very small, very interesting, and in the UK at least, very rare car, it's also not really a Volvo. Time for a quick history lesson. I'm sure you've all heard of DAF, the Dutch company that makes trucks. Well, in the 1950s, they also decided to start building little cars, and the DAF 600 was launched in 1958. They always made fine little cars, but they never really captured anyone's imagination, and they were always considered a little slow, driven by older people. Noddy cars, to those who thought driving a small car was beneath them. Under the skin, though, there was some really interesting engineering going on, and DAF cars made a much bigger mark on the motor industry than you'd think. Pretty much everything car related in this era boils down to the oil crisis and this one is no different. Everybody was suffering and the economic situation meant that a number of companies were now looking for a new small car. Being a small company, DAF were in the perfect situation to be snatched up by a larger firm. Not only would a buyer be blessed with small cars, but it would also secure DAF's future. BMW were interested, but were put off by the whole truck thing. Eventually, DAF would find a buyer in Volvo, who took control in 1975. They were the big winners out of this, as not only would they get DAF's range to play with, but they got the licensing for Renault engines, and, as Sweden wasn't yet a member, access to the European community via DAF's Dutch plant. But they also got the all-new car that DAF was working on. I'll get back to that bit later. Now, back to this particular car. In 1972, the Dutch company launched the DAF 66. It was a development of the old DAF 55, their first water-cooled car and the one that they first took racing. The new DAF 66 had more conventional styling and had a few well-needed engineering upgrades. It's a good-looking little car, this, and it was penned by none other than Giovanni Michelotti. It's very of its period, but it has some lovely little styling touches. It's definitely utilitarian, but those touches really elevate the design. This one is in a very 1970s beige, with suitably 70s as well, black graphics. And somehow in this spec, it does look a little bit Soviet somehow. I'm just going to butt in here and say that you can instantly tell that this is the work of Michelotti. I'm sure I'm not the only one seeing quite a bit of Triumph Dolomite in that rear end. Unusually for a small company like DAF, you could get the 66 in a number of body styles. This one is the two-door saloon, but you could also get a two-door estate. And before Volvo took over, you could also get a mad little two-door coupe. They must have been fantastic little things. Curiously, there was also a weird little mini moke style thing for the Dutch military, known as the YA-66. After Volvo's takeover in 1975, the car was simply rebadged as a Volvo 66, although there were a few Volvo-y style changes under the skin, all in the name of safety. First and most noticeably, there was a new grille, bigger bumpers, head restraints and a softer steering wheel. Hidden were the side impact beams. Very, very unusual for a car of this age. Apart from that though, it was the same as the old DAF and it was made through to 1980. It was produced at the Nedcar factory in the Netherlands, the same plant that made stacks of Volvos, Mitsubishis, and now Minis. DAF cars have always striked me as a weird blend of innovative and antique technology. There's a bit of both in the underpinnings. By the late 1970s, most manufacturers of small cars had switched over to front-engine and front-wheel drive, but DAF hadn't. This was good old front-engine, rear-wheel drive, and with the transmission at the rear, like a Porsche 944. So let's start at the front and work our way back. Under the bonnet is a Renault engine. It's the same Cleon font unit used in pretty much every Renault from the 60s to the 90s. It's four cylinders, overhead valves, and you could get it in the 66 in either 1.1 or 1.3 litres, and either 46 or 56 horsepower. All things considered, that's not very interesting. Neither is the torsion bar front suspension, but it gets a whole lot more interesting at the back. 
First of all is the rear suspension. Now earlier DAFs had used swing axles, the same setup that Volkswagen had abandoned because Beetles had grown a bit of a tendency to switch ends. Swing axles aren't great, but of course the gearbox was also at the back so it acted as a transaxle and here is where it gets interesting. DAF went and put in a De Dion tube, like a Rover P6 or an Aston Martin. Far too complicated for a simpleton like me to explain well, but it acts like a dead axle and keeps the two rear wheels in line at all times. The tube rests on good old leaf springs and through the differential into the transmission, here is where it gets really interesting. And here is also the bit that most of you have probably been waiting for. Very amatic. DAF's own continuously variable transmission. Much more efficient than a traditional automatic and of course continuously variable. No set gears. There's a centrifugal clutch and a pair of belt drives that run on pulleys. The cones move in and out continuously varying the ratios based on both vacuum and centrifugal force. Now surprisingly the boot space is actually quite good because I'd have expected maybe that with the um, transmission in the rear the boot floor would be very very shallow and it's not really very deep and yes um, there is no spare wheel under here the spare wheels under the bonnet um, but there is a really really good load space here and especially with it being an older car it is just you know a single sk skin of metal and then your entire boot space but that is really quite practical uh, for its size obviously you have a load lip but again that's of its era um, really much more practical boot than I expected and interestingly the fuel filler um, very much a relic of older times is um, on a flap behind the normal plate there um, you really don't see that kind of thing even in cars really you know from the late 70s that was becoming a very very rare thing but yeah a really really good boot space Inside, it is a sea of black vinyl. Um, black vinyl on the dashboard, black vinyl on the doors, black vinyl on the seats as well, although these ones do have seat covers on them um, just to protect them. Lots and lots of black, not very much color at all. Um, even, even the steering wheel in front of you is completely black, uh, that Volvo safety steering wheel. But beyond the steering wheel is the only real bit of color in this interior, the orange gauges. Um, just a very simple little um, little gauge pod uh, with two different dials in. Your first dial on the right hand side is your speedometer. Um, it goes up to 110 miles per hour. Um, I love the font. The font's quite 1960s as well. Uh, not the kind of thing you might expect by 1977, but I don't know. Um, 39,000 miles from you. 39,000. And that is original. There is a full service history with this car, a, a folder about this thick full of documentation and this is the original bill of sale for this very car on the 10th of December 1977 um, and the lady that bought it paid £2,533.92. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, this car has a really fantastic history. Um, to back up the 39,000 mile reading on the odometer there. On the left hand side you have a fuel gauge at the top and a battery gauge at the bottom and then just a simple um, light for your temperature and for your oil pressure. No actual temperature gauge which I think is a bit, little bit weird in this car especially considering they give you a battery gauge. Um, they, they do give you a voltage gauge. No numbers on it but they, they give you a gauge anyway but no temperature gauge. I don't know but there you go. Uh, there is one additional gauge uh, which is the rev counter there in the middle, the tachometer. Uh, which is mounted up there. Now, the owner that owns this car now doesn't know whether this was a thing that could be fitted from the factory. Certainly, there's nothing um, from the history that would, but this car was a, was a two-owner car from new, um, the, and the previous owner had it for 40 years, and so he must have fitted this at some stage or got a Volvo dealer to fit it or, or whatever, but it does have this tachometer, and of course, the red line is at 3,000 RPM of course, because the um, CVT gearbox keeps it, um, keeps the revs at um, their optimum point at all times. So there's no need to be to be ringing the engine out at 7,000 RPM. You can all stay down here and everything can be nice and jolly. There is a big dash rail across here again in uh, black vinyl and you have two switches on it here. Now, the first one is your lights, as you'd expect, side lights and headlamps. Um, and then there's this button, which is a little bit more curious. This is a hill descent button. 
Now, with the variomatic transmission, if you start going down a hill, the car will start accelerating. So if you press this button when you're going down a hill, you'll start getting engine braking in. Um, and so that is, I suppose, quite valuable, but uh, it's not something I can imagine a lot of uh, owners would have actually used. Uh, and I can imagine they would have just used the brake pedal instead. But if you do want engine braking, um, you can have it on there like that. On the other side of the binnacle, there are another two switches, uh, one here for your hazards, which makes a very, very quiet noise. Um, and it is on a separate relay to the indicators because the indicators make a different noise. And I'll put them on now. And the audio is not going to be perfect because I've got the windows open because it's a warm day, but that's a wonderful analog indicator sound from a relay. Absolutely brilliant. And you see when you put the ignition on those, the oil light and the temperature light obviously light up. Um, now down below them, you know, out of sight now, um, is a button for your heated rear window, um, just there. And then below then you have a light for your choke, your choke which is down here on the left hand side of the steering column and a light for your handbrake as well. But they are both obscured by the steering wheel. So um, I can't really see how much use they'd be. It'd be much better to have them here, but that's just the way they did it. And there is a switch blank as well on the side, just to let you know that as you hadn't chosen the top spec car, you hadn't gone for all the options, you were a disappointment. In the center, there is a blank where I assume a radio would go. Um, so no radio in this car, no speakers in the front, although there are speaker grills in the back. I don't know whether this car had a radio at some stage and has got rid of it or whatever, um, but that I assume is where a radio would go. There is a glove box on this side, uh, which is quite a decent sized glove box really, considering the dashboard is very, very small. It is obviously an old car, so the windscreen is very upright. The dashboard is very, very shallow. Um, so a nice glove box. Um, and then you have an ashtray of course, because you need an ashtray in the 1970s, and of course a cigarette lighter as well, um, down on the center console. On the left hand side, you have your heater control. So you have the heater fan here, uh, which feels like a twin speed heater fan. In fact, should we have a little look? There you go, there's your heater fan. Um, it either seems as though it's a one speed heater fan, um, or one of all the resistors gone, and therefore it isn't getting the, the central setting, whatever. Uh, below that you have the actual heat control, so cold and hot. Um, and then in a brilliant uh, little dose of um, engineering economy, um, the uh, direction control between the windscreen and your feet are just done through little uh, toggles here to, um, to move the flaps that do um, the direction on both sides. There's two separate ones. So you can have, the passenger can have um, air to their feet and the driver can have air going up to the windscreen here to um, demiss their view. Um, there's a wonderful little bit of practical um, economical engineering there. Uh, in the centre console, you have a very, very cheap centre console um, with a couple of gauge blanks. I suppose you could have got a clock here or something like that. The owner's put a, a thermometer in there. Um, and there is also a switch for the um, spot lamps on the front, the additional um, spot lamps. Um, I think the um, 66 DLs didn't have the extra, the extra spot lamps, but this being a GL, I think it did. Although there are no pictures in this brochure of anything but a GL. Um, so there you go. Nice little cubby hole of stuff to put there. I suppose you can put your phone down there, but it might rattle about a little bit. And then we move down to the transmission lever, uh, which is a little bit curious because it is a standard PRND setup. Uh, but when Volvo took over DAF, uh, they changed this because originally they just had a neutral and then a push forward to go forwards and pull back to go uh, into reverse. Uh, very, very simple lever. But Volvo put in a much more conventional PRND setup just, I suppose, again, to make the car seem more normal. Um, but I can't help but thinking that the original DAF um, lever would have been a little bit more practical. It makes more sense in reality. Uh, but then again, the P does have the um, transmission brake, of course. But I'm just sure you have a handbrake to, um, to go for that. But anyway, um, that's all by the by. There is not much else in here. Um, you have a nice cream headlining, which really offsets the um, darkness down below. So there is a little bit of light in this interior. Um, and you have twin sun visors, nothing on the driver's one, uh, but you do get a little tiny mirror in the, in the passenger one. Um, these also swing across as well, which I suppose is quite nice for the early 70s. Um, 
and you get quarter lights, um, but unfortunately they don't open. Um, everybody loves a quarter light, but uh, they don't open here. Uh, keep fit windows, of course, uh, with a very, very nice smooth action to them. Um, they're very nice. Um, you have a door pull, of course. That's a nice stunk, that. Really, um, quite a it feels like a good quality car, this. Um, despite the fact that um, in the later 70s, especially, um, once the Volvo 300 series was introduced, Volvo had a couple of quality gripes with DAF um, and their factory, but this car feels exceptionally well put together. Quite tinny, because of course there isn't much sound deadening, the doors themselves are very thin, but it feels you know, very, very well put together nonetheless. Now, we're in a big, empty, open car park here, and this is probably one of the most interesting cars I've ever been in. So, should we go for a little spin? Um, I suppose we probably should. So, we will have a little bit of choke, I think. We probably will need some. There you go. Uh, it's lovely and smooth, actually, that little Renault engine. Uh, we get rid of the choke. Yep, that hasn't made any difference, but there we go. The pedals are in a very weird position, actually. Your left foot wants to go for the brake pedal because they're very far over. Uh, the wheel arch intrusion is massive into the, the footwell, probably because you just sit so uh, so far forward close to the wheels. Right, we are into drive. Handbrake off. And there isn't really, there isn't a creep forwards on this. But with this being a CVT, it just revs and it just goes. And so there you go, we're just over 2,000 RPM. And it just, it's just going. Of course, if I lift off, the revs will go down as the, as the variomatic, um, you know, does its thing. But it's a very weird scenario, just have this endless wave of the engine just going. See, just under 3,000 RPM. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, a weird, weird car to drive just because of that transmission um, but of course very very easy um, DAF marketed this car as a car for a car you could your auntie could drive uh, you know something very very simple and um, easy to drive um, and the variomatic system was well proven as well DAF went rallying and racing with these transmissions and found them to be you know, very, very good and very worthy. Um, and, and they did and they did work very, very well. They lasted quite a long time, the belts as well. Um, the twin belt system in this particular car. So, there you go, there's a little drive. Uh, we'll park back up now. Um, and yeah, it is amazing because it's, of course, centrifugal clutch, um, unlike a standard automatic transmission. I take my foot off the brake and the car doesn't move. Uh, the centrifugal clutch needs you to put power onto the throttle to get it to go. But um, there you go, Volvo 66 or DAF 66, um, and that is that endless elastic spring um, of, the, of the transmission that just holds the revs um, as a CBT does. Fantastic. Remember I mentioned that new car that DAF was working on? Well, that was the DAF 77, the car that would eventually replace this little thing, despite the fact it was a little bit bigger. Well, after the Volvo takeover, that car was renamed and launched as the Volvo 300 series. There's a lot more DAF on the roads than you'd think, and of course it was available with that fantastic variomatic transmission. So there you go, a look at a car that probably deserves a little bit more recognition. For a small manufacturer like DAF to create something so unorthodox is wonderful, and although they're very rare, that makes it all the more special when you do see one on the roads. So for now, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. It makes a lot more difference than you think. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.